We're speaking with Chris Stewart-Bon, who is the author of Whisper, a young adult contemporary, slightly futuristic contemporary novel um, that was released April 1st through Orca Books. Um, so Chris, I was creeping your website a little bit, and um, it's really interesting because there are three rather distinct links that you have going there um, all, that pertain to your book, obviously, and those three are factory farming, cleft palate, and children living on the streets. Can you talk a bit about how these three things combine to create the world of your novel of Whisper? Yeah, right. Well, I appreciate the research that you've done there. You certainly tapped into some important elements of the book. Um, so the main character, Whisper, is born with a cleft palate, and um, her family doesn't realize that the medical technology is available to correct this cleft palate, so she doesn't have it fixed. And it becomes a very distinctu distinguishing feature of hers, of course. And so people react to her. Um, and when she's first born, her father sees her and thinks, okay, I don't want to deal with her, right? Mm. And what ends up happening is she's sent to a camp outside of the village, and she's raised there. Um, and she grows up with other children who also have disabilities, so they're not the same as hers. And it's, it's a situation where she's with family. It's very remote. But at the same time, she's cared for and appreciated, and she has friends. Mm. Um, but then when she's 16, her father comes to get her. Her mother has recently died. And uh, he says, okay, now you're going to take your mother's place in the family, you know, do the cooking and the cleaning and that sort of thing. So she moves to the village. In the village, she's not accepted at all. Um, and people react to her very negatively. Uh, and she ends up having to wear a veil over her head to mm -hmm. sort of hide her disfigurement. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get to the point where uh, the father says, okay, this isn't working. You're going to go to the city, and in the city you're going to make money for us by begging on the street. Uh, so that's where child labor comes into, into effect. And then as you read farther into the book, you realize that the reason... She has the cleft palate, and the reason there are so many children born with deformities is because of factory farming um, mm. and the um, chemicals that are used to sort of get rid of the entrails, the offshoots of the mm -hmm. factory farming, and those chemicals have seeped into the ground and caused deformities in children. Ah, so the, the deformities that people are shunning in the city are environmentally, sorry, it's environmental hazards that have caused the deformities in the children. Exactly. Okay. And they don't realize that. I mean, it's, I think, I would say it's somewhat like our current society where mm. um, there are all sorts of chemicals in the environment and smog, and, and we don't really know what effect that has on people. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a similar situation where, where they're not aware of what's causing the deformities, and yet there are some clues. Okay. Whisper is, is a book set in the described as not too distant future um, but the setting itself as I understand is rather unspecific is that right is it it's somewhat vague in in terms of time and place yeah it, it is and that was actually a conscious decision mm -hmm. because um, I you know I didn't want it set in a certain country right mm -hmm. and then there would be sort of Oh, I don't know, subconscious accusations. I wanted it to be a sort of generic, this could be anywhere. This could happen to any of us. This mm -hmm. is the world we live in. Mm -hmm. So it, did you set out to write a cautionary tale, do you think? Or were you just writing about a girl who was sort of marginalized in her family and then... Yeah, I would definitely say it was not a cautionary tale. I was having a conversation with my aunt who lives in a in Vancouver, B.C., and she um, she was a receptionist in a doctor's office, and the doctor she worked for was an immigrant from India. And this doctor had immigrated for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons was she was really frustrated um, because in India she would see many children on the streets who had medical conditions that were fixable. Mm. And yet she felt like she couldn't do anything about, you know, these conditions of these children and for a variety of reasons, and one of those was, you know, maybe the families didn't realize that the condition could be fixed, or they thought they couldn't afford to fix it, 
Uh, but one of the reasons also was that they needed the income that their child would bring in from begging on the streets. Mm-hmm. And I, I just remember having that conversation with my aunt and being, you know, afterwards, it's sort of sinking in, you know, mm-hmm. and thinking, wow, right? Mm-hmm. This is the world we live in where there are children who make a living for their family because of this situation. Right. And then I thought, and, and then what if you were that child? Right? What if you were the child and realized, like, you came of age and started to be aware of the world around you and begin to be critical of it, and you realized, you know, I could have had this medical condition fixed and my life could have been very different. Right. So that that was actually where the idea came from. Mm. It was more, what would it look like through the eyes of someone in that situation? I see. And and living in North America, I don't, you know, I don't think we see a lot of that. I, I think it probably does still occur. Um, but it certainly is occurring elsewhere in the world. Right. Tell me, is there hope in the book? Are we foolish to hope for better things? Like, how reasonable is hope, in your opinion? Well, there absolutely is hope. I, I mean, there's there's no doubt about it that um, Whisper, the main character, has a very tough life. Um, but she, she does end up going to the city, and she discovers friends there. And she also discovers that she, um, you know, has other assets, right? That she's smart and she's able to play the violin and she can use these ways to make a living and she doesn't necessarily have to rely on her medical condition. Mm. Um, and so by the end of the book, she does have hope and she does have a place, mm-hmm. but it's true that it's kind of a rough road getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so um, a little bit about you as a writer. Uh, when would you say are your most productive writing times? Is there a specific time of day that you feel like you are particularly inspired, or how do you write? Oh, that's a good question. I think it's not necessarily when is my most inspired time, but when can I squeeze it in, mm-hmm. right? Oh, so true. Um, I do work full-time, and I do have kids, and and so it, it ends up being, okay, I can do a little bit here at night, or, you know, mm-hmm. I can do a little bit here mid-morning. Mm-hmm. Um so it just depends on, on when I can squeeze it in. Mm-hmm. I don't have a set schedule, and I'm not very faithful about writing every day. So mm-hmm. I'm not sure I'm a great example for young writers out there. <laughs> what part of Whisper will you read for us, Chris? Um, so in this part of Whisper, she's been, she's been brought to the village where her family lives, and she's with her father and her brother's. Um, but she's not well accepted. And her father, Balin, works on the um, town council, and he brings some other members of the council to give him advice, I guess, on Whisper and what he should do with her. And that's the scene is when the men come and visit her and decide what they should do. Lydia, Whisper, Balin said. The curtness in his voice was obvious, and I didn't dare hide from him. I opened the door to the bathroom and walked down the short hallway until I stood in the front room behind the couch. Three men stood in the doorway. One was very old, older than Nathaniel, with curved shoulders and an enormous nose that did not fit his face, having continued to grow while his face did not. The other man beside Balin was very tall and younger than the others. He twitched his hands as he stood in the doorway, unable to still his restless body. Take off the veil, Balin said. I slid the veil off my head and looked again at the men without the blurring of the fabric. In return, they examined me, the older man looking at me with one eye as though his vision were blocked by his nose, and the other one looking once, then quickly looking away. The pause while they examined me lasted as long as it takes the turtle to cross the log over our pond. The older man spoke. You've been on the council for many years, Balin, and you would not lose your position, but having a reject in the house does not improve your reputation among the villagers. I'd keep her hidden if I were you, the younger man spoke so quickly, biting off the words that I had to think about what he'd said after he'd finished. She's cleaned the house, Balin swept his arm through the air, indicating all I'd picked up and polished. And if she's able to make the bread for the store, she provides us with income. Both of these are useful to me right now. If she works elsewhere, who will cook for us, wash the clothing, keep the house in order? This is why I need her. If she works in the city, she'll make more money. You'd be able to afford a housekeeper. The older man took a step forward, peering under his hooded eyes, hovering in front of me like a vulture. His bony hand reached out as though he would grab my arm, but instead he pointed at my face. 
and then made the sign of a cross in the air. She can't stay, Balin. It doesn't look good. As a leader in this town, you must set the example. And contaminating your home and your reputation with this girl will hurt your standing. You were right to get rid of her. Speak with Kelsa when he returns. Send her away. Have her earn money in other ways, where she isn't visible as a presence in your house. Balin said nothing, but looked at me as though he'd never observed my features before. I felt heat rise into my cheeks. I stood in front of them, a human being with feelings, intelligence, and ideas, yet they treated me as though I weren't even there. Balin was no better than the strangers speaking to them instead of to me. Would he have acted differently had my mother been around?